Right, uh, I've split this talk into uh, three parts. Um, just having a review of the Digithin modulator itself. Um, there's the SI570 frequency synthesizer which fits underneath the Digithin and uh, some thoughts on the, uh, the ATV audio. Holding the screen now. So, just a reminder the Digithin is a uh, narrowband QPSK modulator um, and it uses, uh, takes input from F5 OEO software. RPI DATV, which is running on the Raspberry Pi, takes the IQ input and modulates and filters and amplifies that and gives about a one milliwatt output. So the, some of the design goals were easy to build. It uses the largest size of, uh, of surface mount. These are all 1206 style. Um, the chips are SOIC, which is 1.27 millimeter. So it's not like the little modulator on the uh, on the Digilite, which is 0.65, I think. Very tricky. Um, so easy to build, um, no adjustments on it, and uh, <coughs> multi multi symbol rate without any change of components. So they were the design goals, and with the the year of the 146 meg extension ticking away, I decided to release it early as an experimental project as it was seen to be just about good enough with hopefully some improvements to come. Just a reminder on the block diagram, the, this is the Raspberry Pi 26 pin header, um, F5 OEO <laughs> software is sending the I and the Q, uh, it takes a 4 megahertz clock into the DS PIC microcontroller some commands go out on the uh, the UART. DS pick does the uh, digital filtering because these square waves, the INQ are square waves, you can't transmit those, so you have to filter them very precisely um, to stop the the modulation of the uh, I and the Q interfering with each other. You then reconstruct the signal with the digital to analog converter and that needs to be analog filtered as well into the modulator. Local oscillator, you could have an external one or as we'll see the SI570, the internal one. And then out to a mimic to give you about uh, a milliwatt. Um, it hasn't been completely su successful. There are things I'd like to improve on it. Um, the DAC really isn't up to the job, but it was own, the only one I could find which had the right number of pins, you interface in the right way, it was big enough to solder the most important thing, um, but it's not really fast enough and that's um, led to some complications. So this is the output spectrum. 200 kilohertz per division, 33K, so ideally you want it um, to be about 500 kilohertz wide. So it's looking quite nicely up to about this point, then it um, deteriorates. So if it kept on going, you'd probably hit about 500 kilohertz for the, uh, the bandwidth. As it stands, that's um, top of the screen is PEP, so if you just put all the power into one carrier, that's where it would come out at. So you could say these are about 55 dB down, which isn't too bad, but it could be better. But the problem is these shoulders here. I thought I could get rid of them by tweaking the digital filtering. But unfortunately, it, uh, it hasn't been possible because of the, uh, the slowness of the DAC. It really can't rebuild the signal accurately enough, the, the output waveform. This is the output of the DAC when it's trying to reconstruct a, um, a sine wave. And you can see how long it's taking. When it changed, it should be rectangular. It should snap down, then stay at the level, then snap down. 
but it's almost sinusoidal in the way it's changing. And really, <coughs> really you want sharp edges, rectangles, which will get taken out by the analog filters. And even here, you can see it's, it's uh, not symmetrical. It's so uh, it's not even at the, the peaks and the troughs. It's uh, it's a peculiar shape again. So that's all adding to the. Uh, um, well, it's all really causing the uh, the shoulders because it really can't reconstruct the signal accurately enough, which you do need to do as you get the further down you want to take the uh, the stop band. You really do need the output signal to be very, very accurate. This is the multi symbol rate what I'm working on. I'm overdriving something somewhere, so ignore the level of the shoulders. They're far too high, but just as a comparison. That's the, the 333k symbols as before. This is the 166 half the symbol rate. You can see it starts off quite nicely, but as soon as it gets to the same level, about um, it's 50 down on this, the shoulders start. And the, it doesn't matter how narrow you make this, if you go down to 125, you're going to have it nicely narrowed down to here, and then the shoulder, shoulders will start. So it's not as though it's going to be. Uh, just a, a small bit of shoulder. The shoulders are going to extend out to the the same point here, whatever the um, the symbol rate is. And again, that's all down to the uh, to the DAC. Um, really, you need it to be much more accurate. It's a 12-bit uh, DAC. Again, it was the only one I could find to do the job. So this is the. Um, theoretical response of the filter with a 12-bit DAC. Um, red is the amplitude, blue is the phase. So you can see it's pretty sharp, but it doesn't keep on going. With a 12-bit DAC, you get all this lot out here, uh, which shouldn't be so bad. It's 64 dB down at the top. Uh, this is running at 333K symbols. It's oversampled four times every bit, so the sampling rate of the DAC is 1.3 meg. At uh, 333k symbols, each you have 333k on I and 333k on Q. So on each of I and Q, you're getting a new bit potentially every three microseconds. So the fastest square wave you can generate is 010101, which would be six microseconds. So that's why you have to start rolling off your analog filter after the DAC at 166. Sorry, the, the digital filter starts rolling off at uh, about 166 here and does pretty well until it gets down to there. But this is theoretical for 12 bits. The DAC won't be accurate anyway, and because it's really not fast enough to be outputting samples at 101.3 meg, then uh, that just compounds the problem. So if the DAC was perfect, you'd be down to 64, which wouldn't be too bad at all. Just to show how, that, how important it is for the output signal to be reconstructed accurately, this is 333k symbols as per the previous shot. Um, and this is with a 16 bit DAC. And you can see the difference now in the, the stop band. It goes down and it pretty much stays down. So uh, there's probably a few bits in here you can't see because it's so, uh, so narrow. But I think you get around about 6 dB per bit. So Theoretically, another 20, 24 from there. It's not, it's never quite the same because you get some these variations in the uh, in the stop band. So it'll be it'll be doing down here somewhere, but uh, 80 would be more than adequate. So, um, what to do about it? I can't see anything you can do with the current hardware. Uh, I think it's going to have to be a new DAC. So I'm looking at a little board you can replace the current DAC with, or drop on, or connect somehow. Um, it won't be home brewable, well not by me anyway, it'll be such a tiny 0.65 mil, 0.5 mil chip, it's, uh, it's, uh, I wouldn't solder it myself so I wouldn't ask anybody else to, but I see lots of wonderful demos on YouTube about sticking bits of paste on, and, but um, I'd rather stick with something I can uh, solder the old fashioned way. <coughs> So I'm hoping to improve that, but it's uh, at the moment it's really fixed at 333k. Um, 
uh, even though the intention was to have it multi multi symbol rate. What you can do is adjust the the analog filter that comes after the uh, the DAC. Um, we just go back to the other one. The only reason these shoulders don't go on forever is that the the analog filter that comes after the the DAC starts to roll off about here and its main job is to roll off down to here by the time there will be an image of this at the sampling frequency so this pattern will reappear at 1.33, 2.66 and so on so the analog filter starts rolling off there and takes it out by the time it gets to uh, uh, 2.66 um, so I, I tighten that up very slightly so you can do that and try and cut the edge off here but um, say you wanted just to have a 166 symbol rate device you could recalculate the the 5 pole LC filter after the, uh, after the DAC and uh, you'd have exactly the same pattern that you'd have 100 kilohertz per division it would look exactly the same but it would mean that you're stuck then at just running at 166k symbols so that is an option for the moment One of the, the aims was to have it not needing any adjustment. Um, on the Digilite, you remember the pots, you've got levels and you've got four things to juggle to try and get it right. So the, the data sheet for the, the modulator says without adjustment it will do about minus 35 dB local oscillator, minus 35 dB um, sideband suppression, which would be fine. This is a very old photo. It's um, in the middle, that's the local oscillator, that's the lower sideband, that's the upper sideband. So the, the sideband suppression is pretty good. Um, but it's only about 16 dB local oscillator suppression, 16, 17. Um, this is one of the older ones I got off the uh, eBay somewhere. The ones from the BATC shop in the kits have been achieving about 25 without any adjustment. But you can tweak it slightly by adjusting the, the DC levels on the, the IQ inputs of the modulator. Um, I was hoping to avoid that, but um, that seems to be the only way at the moment. It's, it does actually achieve 35 dB if you drive it the way they say. They say drive it with one volt peak to peak on the, uh, the IQ inputs. But if you do that, all the, the sidebands and the, um, they come up and it's... Uh, the shoulder even be worse so I had to drop it down far enough but having dropped it down it hasn't done anything to the local oscillator that stays where it is yet the sidebands have all dropped down so comparatively speaking it's um, the local oscillator suppression is much worse so I'm looking at a technique for doing that. that's the reason for the pot in the uh, in the kit by the way so I found that by just putting a resistor across one of the capacitors on the uh, the modulator I could tune the MER on the receiver about 15 to 30 dB. Uh, so I thought, oh, simple, just the one pot, but uh, I must have been lucky because pre uh, subsequent ones I've tried have been a bit more difficult, um, needing a couple of the uh, adjustments made at the same time, so I'm still looking into that. Just a quick look at the modulator. Uh, there's the, the I input, the Q input, so the, the balanced differential inputs like the, um, uh, the 88, 3, 4, 5 and 6, but self-biasing, so uh, whereas the 88346, you have to actually put bias on and then put the signal on the bias. These you just uh, AC couple and um, it makes it very simple if you were driving it hard enough to uh, <coughs> so that the, uh, the side bands were at uh, a high level. Also the local oscillator, it seems to regenerate it internally, which um, I thought was strange. If you change the local oscillator input level, you don't seem to change the output, which you, you do on the, uh, the 88346. I think this is the reason. It needs a certain value here, a certain amplitude. Then it, uh, it sorts itself out, which is why if you have it too high or too low, it doesn't like it and it, you need uh, to drop the local oscillator level as you reduce in frequency. Um, if you drop it too low it turns into a comb generator, it looks, uh, looks horrendous. I 
was thinking, what can I do with this corner of the board? Um, so we always need a local oscillator for um, for uh, the, the modulator. So I thought, well, why not try one of these SI570 modules? So again, this is experimental. Um, whether you can actually have something which is putting out 10 dBm and only requiring minus 20 inputs and have it unshielded and connected to everywhere um, <coughs> remains to be seen. It may need to be mounted externally, but for the moment it sits on the... Uh, the I squared C port from the Raspberry Pi, and uh, I've written some software to uh, to drive it. Uh, seems to work okay. Knowles is uh, working fine. Um, again, how much filtering do you need? It's um, you seem to be able to run it as a multi-band transmitter, so uh, two meters and seventy cents at the same time, which is uh, not always uh, desirable, but handy for demos. So, again. Experimental. The the modules themselves are uh, well, they come in for several flavours. The from SDR kit seems to be the only source, as far as I know. Um, so that would do two meters quite easily. Gets a bit expensive when you want to uh, to cover seventy sams, and uh, even more so if you want to cover twenty three. But uh, the digital thing will only go up. The modulator only goes up to I think it's about several hundred, so you can't really uh, use it for 23 sams. Um, but the level of uh, harmonics out of these things, it's, it's a square wave out of this particular model. Um, it's only a few dB down at 70 sams, so uh, maybe with a, a helical filter you could just pick off the, uh, the harmonic you want and just use the, uh, use the cheap one. I thought originally, I had one of the um, forget the name, but one of the other kits that SDR kits do with the, the modulator in, so the, uh, the VCO in. I thought it remembered its frequency when you power it down, but apparently not. It's the actual kit that was doing that. So I thought maybe you could just pre-program it and put it in a box and leave it at that. So uh, you do need to be, do need to set it up after uh, every power up. This long number on it, that, that specifies a certain power on frequency. Um, so, which in this case is 56.32 megs, which isn't much use to, uh, to anybody. Um, so you do have to uh, tell it what the frequency is when you start it up. And that, on the Raspberry Pi, that could go into in one of the, the setup files, the, uh, or the uh, autoexec.bat, as, uh, as we all know, the equivalent of. Uh, not too bad to solder. The, the pins are certainly quite far apart. There's three either side and there's one at either end. A sort of vertical half barrel, so they're slightly tricky, but you're not going to short one pin to another. I find the difficult thing is not to actually solder the case to everywhere, but it's it's not too bad. Well, this, this is the harmonic output of it, and <laughs> as you can see, it's uh, it's quite lively. That's going across the. Uh, 1250 uh, megahertz range of the HP 141, so I don't think it's particularly well calibrated. It should be going down a bit more, but that's about 145 megs, and as you'd expect for, for a square wave, the odd harmonics are greater level than the, the even ones. So that's uh, 435 megs, so you could easily put a hel helical there and just tap that one off and um, say it's buying the more expensive module. You see how far it can go. So I think uh, I did a test with Noel. We were okay, okay on two meters with 70 sam. I don't think we made it on 23 sams though, did we? No, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> no, it doesn't go. No. Even though there appears to be something there, it's, uh, it didn't like it much, but then the, the modulator thing spec up to a few hundred megs. <coughs> That's the circuit of the little board, not much in it. Um, J1 is the, uh, goes on to fit on the connector on the Raspberry Pi, the one uh, near the 26 pin header. So you just need some uh, isolating capacitors, Pi um, attenuator, maybe even not a Pi attenuator, there's no real need to match the output of the, uh, the chip to anywhere. It's probably better if you just leave that out and use that as a voltage divi divider. There's no point in pulling current out of the, the chip. Uh, if you don't need it, just generating more RF. So anyway, down to experiment. I'll, uh, 
I'll put the details uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'll put these on the, uh, the forum somewhere so you can, you can have a go with it. <coughs> I've written some software for the Raspberry Pi to control it. Again, I'll put this uh, up with the, uh, the hardware details. So there's a few ways of using it. Uh, you just uh, run the program. It assumes the, the startup frequency of the module is 56.32. You can change that. It just tells you it's found the chip and what the frequency is. The, they have a crystalline, which is supposed to be 114.258, I think, but they're not precise. So the way they calibrate the module is that they if they say it's going to be 56.32 it will be 56.32 but the internal dividers are adjusted to cope with the crystal that's it the actual crystal frequency so you have to work out you have to read the um, all these registers work out what the crystal is assuming it's producing 56.32 so there's no problem with the crystal being off, it just means you have to do a bit of calibration when you, when you start up. This is something you could put in uh, the startup file in the Raspberry Pi, you just give it dash F and the frequency you want and it's, um, I'll put a, a um, quiet mode in so all this stuff doesn't come out, this is just for development really, just showing all the, the registers. Um, so it sets the uh, output to 146.5, turns the output on. There's a little mod you have to do on the board if you want to have output control, which is probably worthwhile. You, you may want to feed in something external rather than use, the, uh, use this internal one. Uh, this, these are the parameters, so dash F, just give it the frequency. You can turn it on and off with the N command. By default, the software doesn't let you use set frequencies outside the UK amateur band just for, for safety. If you want to do that, you just give it a dash X and you can make it go anywhere. Um, well, if you haven't actually got one, you can just uh, see what the register values are. You might be using it for something else. And the different modules have different um, frequencies when they power up. So the software needs to know that, so it can do its own calibration and find out what the crystal frequency is. Um, so you give it this dash P, I think, um, what was the other 100 meg? Someone has 100 meg? Right. So you just give it dash P 100, and it writes that away for future reference. And, uh, and it, will, it will know next time to, uh, that, that is uh, the start of frequency so we can calculate back calculate the crystal frequency from the, the register values. Just a few thoughts on audio which the uh, I think we've done in other ways the Raspberry Pi might be able to do it and the DigiThen. <coughs> the perennial problem of audio delay you can't really have a conversation with anybody on a talkback frequency um, if you're using digital because of the uh, you have a, about a second delay in the the, uh, the signal, so it's pretty hopeless. And on, on repeaters where you have several people coming in, having a conversation, um, then it's uh, probably even worse trying to have a two-way conversation with a, a one second delay either way. So far we've been limited by the, uh, the set-top boxes. We have to do things in the way they want it and there's not much way around uh, around it. With the now we have software-based transmitters, then we can do different things with audio. We're not um, stuck with just taking our input from a PVR 150, say. We can take it in other ways. And now with um, Tutune, we have control over the reception, so we can do anything we like now. We don't have to, as long as we make it look like a transport stream, we don't have to conform to any spec if we don't want to. There's fields for private data within the transport stream, so you can do anything you like really. So that gives us quite a bit of flexibility to uh, do some different things with audio. The Digilite audio is 192 k bits per second, which when you're at the 333k symbols and have only a few hundred k of data for video, you don't want to be taking over a third of it for, uh, for audio. So um, is there a better way of doing it?
MP2 normally uses, uh, sorry, DVBS normally uses MP2 format audio. I think you can drop that down to 32K, possibly even 16K bits per second, which uh, isn't too bad. So um, it was certainly worth looking at uh, lower compression rates for uh, lower data rates for the MP2 audio and leave more room for the video. But there are all sorts of codecs, uh, coder decoders for uh, audio out there. Um, D-Star, of course, is a digital uh, system which uses a, a codec, uh, A and B E, but that's uh, proprietary. Um, I think you have to buy the chips to use that or certainly not uh, easy to interface to if at all possible. Silk, um, an audio codec used on Skype. Kelt, I forget what it stands for, but another codec, and that Kelt and Silk were combined into Opus. Uh, I believe this is what uh, Sky, Skype uses now. And that gets you down to uh, 6 k bits per second, which is, if we've got 500 k bits per second, that's really nothing. That's, that's excellent. It's also even lower, Codec 2, designed by VK5DGR, and I believe he's down to about 700 bits per second now um, in some trials. So uh, that's. Uh, it's hardly worth going uh, much below a, a few thousand because it's, it's not going to have much impact on your uh, your uh, video. Uh, Copus, well, Opus is open source, Codec 2 is open source, so you can uh, get the source code and play around with them. Um, and they're used in the FreeDV HF voice system and in the, uh, the Flex 6000 SDR. So I've got to take some test files off the uh, his site just to see what the um, demonstrate what the quality is like. So 128k bits per second. That's sort of the order we're using. You'd be using with Digilight and things like that. So oh, it's one of these little stubby mice. Where is it? Does that work? All right. Ah. The Navy attacked the big task force. Must be the the Navy attacked the big task force. Well, that's 128K. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the... Oh, technology, I can't cope. I'll increase the screen size when I've finished. <laughs> so 3.2k. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. Would you know if you haven't been told? Force. I don't know. It's uh, the Navy attacked just sounds the big task slightly, force. Slightly the lacking Navy in the top, I think. The big task force. But you probably could tweak that. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. So that's going from 128 to 3k bits per second. The big task force. I think that'd be perfectly the adequate Navy for a. The Navy attacked the big task force. For us. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. I can't really tell the, the difference Navy between the last one. The big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. And back to the original. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked more the big enough. task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked. How do I go back to full screen? No. Uh, F5, I I have to shift it or something. Thanks. So we've got lots of flexibility there for uh, doing things with lower bitrate audio. So here's uh, one idea of what we might do with this. 
uh, I called it fast audio for want of a better title. So on the, the transmitter, uh, video goes through the same path, but we have a separate mic input now. And we encode that with some codec, maybe with that one or even MP2 perhaps. Then we that goes into uh, DATV Express or the RPI DATV system, gets uh, packed in with the, the video and transmitted. On the receive side, we use mini tune, video can go the same way. We have to sacrifice, sacrifice lip sync, of course, you can't, uh, you can't have uh, that as well. But uh, I, I find on the stream the, um, the audio is usually way off and it doesn't seem to detract from the proceedings, so uh, I don't think that would be a problem. And you could always switch between it, you could have the ordinary audio and the, uh, the fast audio. And if you wanted, did need lip sync, then uh, you could always switch uh, back to it. On the audio side, we can extract the audio packets in mini-tune and decode, uh, decode them and send them directly to a sound card. So don't go anywhere near, near VLC, which has a big delay. That's, now we've got the latest version of, uh, of uh, mini-tune, um, which does the, the video internally. That's less of a problem now because we don't have the VLC delay. And that should all be pretty quick. Um, send the audio as soon as it's available. You may have to have a little bit of buffering here. Um, if the operating system goes away and does something for a few milliseconds, you don't want the sound card to run out of data. So um, but it's not gonna be a great deal. Um, so that's, we should be able to get it at least as good as Skype, I would think. All those codecs, even though they're open source, they have, uh, there's lots of software involved with them. I imagine, I haven't looked at them yet, but I imagine there's quite a bit of software to get your head around and uh, dovetail into your own, uh, to your own software. So maybe a slightly simpler approach, uh, ADPCM. PCM is just where you take an 8-bit sample, say every 8,000 times a second, that's the value and you transmit the value. This um, halves the, uh, the amount of data um, and it's very, very simple. You take a 12-bit sample every, say, 8,000 times a second, and you encode that as a 4-bit uh, a sample on the output. So uh, you end up with 32k bits per second. Um, different, adapted differential, it's really measuring the, the slope of the audio, and it's adapting to, as it gets bigger, it encodes the slope into the 4-bits, the amazingly and it changes that as it slows down at the bottom, then the ramps up. So it's always monitoring the, uh, the slope of the, the waveform. And it takes less than a microsecond to encode or decode each of those samples, so very, very quick. And again, you like me to do? yes, you do that, Noel, <laughs> why don't you? We listen to the, uh, this is our original 128K again. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. And the uh, ADPC. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. Slight increase in the background the noise. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked the big task force. The Navy attacked. So, thanks. Um, there's one, one, one more after this. That's the one, yeah. So another, just another thought on how we might use this. Um, on the Digithin, there's a spur pin, which is an analog to digital converter. So with a small microphone amplifier, the Digithin processor could sample the, the audio signal and send that back down the RS-232 port to RPI DATV. It only takes a microsecond to encode each sample. We could packet those up, and as soon as you have a packet, 64, 128 bytes, you put that into the, um, the transport stream. So the actual delay at the transmission end is uh, marginal. And on the mini tuner side, the, we have access to the transport stream on the mini tuner board. It's going from the the NIM module 
on the bus to the FT2232. So it's just there for to do anything we want with it. Um, the 16 pin connector on the mini tuner board isn't connected to anything. Um, the idea originally was to put the transport stream connections to it so it could be extracted. But it uh, proved difficult to route 15 tracks across, across 15 tracks so I decided well nobody's going to want to use that. There are only a few handful of people who want it and now of course once you've done that you think of another reason why you might like to have done it in the first place. But um, it just means a bit of wiring. All the, the points on the board are easily accessible. Uh, so you could have a little board which is monitoring the transport stream with a processor on. It's picking out the, these audio packets with the ADPCM in, um, decoding them and sending to an amplifier so it doesn't go anywhere near Windows at all. So there'll be no Windows lat latency and that should uh, probably be about the fastest you can get. You'd have to have a slight, uh, very, very slight uh, buffering of one of two packets, but as packets are only a few milliseconds each, then uh, no one's going to notice. So uh, um, anyway, this is all pie in the sky at the moment. It's uh, just food for thought, but it's, um, it may solve the perennial problem of uh, you can't really do conversations on DATV. I think that's the last one, so uh, just uh, over time, maybe a couple of minutes for questions, Arnie. For the HO, Albert. Um, on the a couple of slides back, there was a VLC. What does VLC stand for? See, it's there on the bottom of that one. Right. See it at the bottom there. Right, it's popped up. <laughs> okay, thanks. The first version of um, MiniTune uh, didn't decode the um, the audio and video, so you have to send it out somewhere. Um, you send it out as a UDP stream, sort of a network type stream, and um, it's there then for anything to pick up and decode, and VLC is, can um, decode all sorts of different things in all sorts of different sources. But now with the latest version of, we'll see later, the latest version of Minitune, uh, we don't need that anymore, it's all done internally within the software, so uh, uh, it's goodbye VLC. YB. What is the um, the delay in the old VLC? Would you have any idea? I think you can set the the buffer size, but it's I think it's a second or two by default. It's quite big. And the new one? Um, it's pretty much as good as a uh, set dot box. There's very little. Mm. Oh, it'll be the the same delay as the video, but. Um, the video will be delayed less with the um, mini tune that has the internal display. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, Sean's got one. Uh, Sean. Sean, G8VPG. Can you confirm what the local oscillator input levels should be for 437 and 146, please? Yes, there's a. I don't think I've got it on this display. No, I haven't got that slide up. It's um, there's, If you look at the data sheet, it shows you levels at an upper and a lower limit. So minus 10 for 437 megs, minus 10 dBm, and about minus 18 for 146 megs. Right. And if you're below or above that, it, it forms like a, a cone shape, does, is that? No, if you're below that, it's... Um, you're not really driving it hard enough. It, it looks horrible. The output is like a comb generator. You'll have spikes all over the place. Right. Uh, okay. If you're too high, I don't think I'll try that yet, but um, there must be some negative effect. Okay. Thank you. There's quite a wide range. The, the balance suffers. Ah, right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brian. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.